Meccano, part number 216, cylinder from the 1930s blue and gold era, two and a half inches. Hi folks and welcome back. The bathroom build. This build, like a lot from this period, just had me laughing. Not all Meccano is about the engineering that you can see and interact with. Some is about the model or the toy. And some builds just lift your spirits with the thought of the creation. They must have had some fun with these ideas in the design bureau at Meccano. But the history of the bathroom is a wonderful rabbit hole of information. A path that is both as colourful as it is dirty. So grab your yellow rubber ducky as we explore this past. Growing up for me, as a child of the 70s, Sunday night was the official bath night for us. Not that we weren't told to have a bath on other days when we came back covered in mud and God knows what. But Sunday night was, was the night, was the official get clean for school tomorrow night. And I had a plethora of toys that would go in the bath with me. From action man frogmen with a rubber raft to toy boats. I had a wonderful U-boat submarine that would rise and fall with special tablets that dissolved and gave off some type of gas. There was my Playmobil Pirate's Galleon that was just wonderful but somewhat big. Bath time was a playtime in a container filled with water. And of course, you have to have waves. Big waves. Waves so big that the bath wasn't always large enough to contain them. Downstairs, the room under the bathroom was the kitchen. And in line with the bath was my mother's dry foods cupboard. So that's things like flour, lentils and other things that don't mix well with water. Bath night was also a night that the great explorer finding the lost land or fighting sea battles against marauding pirates would get a right proper telling off for making a mess. Apparently tidal waves don't happen much at an elevation of 200 metres above sea level. Well nobody told me that when I was inventing the Mark 1 wave generator. And I always intended not to make such a big wave the next time but normally got carried away in the excitement of the moment. Bathing in private is a new thing. Well, new in the sense of talking about history. And we sort of have the idea of bathing wrong. There's almost a fake history that before the 20th century, baths didn't exist in any great form. But the first public baths date back more than 5,000 years and were found in the Indus Valley region of modern day Pakistan. What was different then was the reason behind bathing. Lacking the knowledge that we have about germs and their link to dirt, bathing at the time had a link to religion and purification of the soul. Along with a bath, we have evidence of soap making dating back as far as 2800 BC in ancient Babylon. And while it was used in the textile industry as well, it would have been used to bathe with. The Ebers Papyrus from ancient Egypt, dating back over three and a half thousand years, explains how to make soap. By mixing animal and vegetable fats together with alkaline salts to produce a soap-like substance. It was used amongst other things to treat sores that were becoming infected and skin diseases, as well as washing both your clothes and the body. The ancient Greeks didn't use soap. They washed using blocks of clay pumice sands and ashes. And even today, we still use clay as a cleaning product. It wasn't until the second century AD that Galen, the famous Greek physician, began to recommend cleaning with soap. The Roman civilization also used abrasive substances such as pumice or sand to remove grime and dirt.
But the Romans were also really big on their public baths. It was a place to go to find out what was going on in the world, the interactive social media of their time. The bathhouse was a place to go and relax in thermal baths and of course to follow there was a cold plunge. While they might not have understood the links to disease as clearly as we do with modern technology, they understood that being clean led to a longer life and that controlling infections was for the betterment of all. In the remains of Pompeii, however, they found the ruins of an entire soap factory dating back to the eruption in 79 AD, so the Romans did use and manufacture soap. But I'm going to use the term factory very loosely here because the first commercially produced soap came much, much later. Soap manufacture carried on as a cottage industry for centuries and it wasn't until the 7th century AD that Arabic chemists started to produce soap made from vegetable oils mixed with aromatic oils. The industry settled around Nables, Kafu and Basra. At the time, they were the first to produce soap that was coloured as well as perfumed. So you can have a nice hot, relaxing bath and come out smelling a darn sight better than when you first went in. They also produced the first shaving soap and the first liquid soap. It took 500 years to catch up and in Britain possibly longer as it was the French and the Italians who were the first to copy the Arabic way of manufacturing this wonderful product in the 12th century. Don't forget that at the time we were busy fighting in the area, all in the name of religion and peace, of course. So copying something that was done by the infidel was just not, well, cricket, which out of interest dates back to around the same time. With this new wonderful smelly product, many people, well men, would partake in public baths. In Britain they were called bagninos, from the Italian for bath. And during Henry VI's reign, he shut them down, all of them, nationwide. The bagninos had another side, probably quite well enjoyed by the men who attended them. And that was as a front for brothels. So maybe not that dissimilar to certain massage parlours now that offer an extra service as well. The public outcry was so extreme that Henry VI was forced to reopen them. In London he limited the number to 12. There's no evidence as to whether this shut down the brothel trade or whether those two bathhouses were just very, very busy. Less than 100 years later, and seven outbreaks of plague, Sir Henry VIII shut the bathhouses for good. They were blamed for the spread of the contagion, and in truth probably would have been a major source for the spread of the infections. And of course, with Henry VIII being such a devout man that he was, come on, we can't say he was lecherous at all. He didn't listen to the requests or, or pleas to reopen them. Instead, the belief that wearing clean white linen against your skin changed each day would fend off any sickness or disease. And the new train in the laundry service was invented. Soap trade, of course, was quick to adapt to the new trade in public laundry houses. During the restoration period in Britain, or when King Charles II retook the crown of Britain, soap was considered a luxury item, and a soap tax was imposed, making it a very expensive item, only to be used by the rich and well-to-do. The tax raised in today's money around £8 billion for the crown, and its manufacture was strictly controlled. The price of soap at the time rises by 300%, making it unaffordable to the common person. It wasn't for another 300 years until the Industrial Revolution that the cottage industry for soap making would explode, so to speak. James Kerr, 
established his chemical works in Tipton in 1780 for the manufacture of alkali from sulphates of potash and soda. Shortly afterwards, he added the manufacturing of soap to his list. In 1790, Nicolas Leblanc, the, the French chemist, discovered how to manufacture alkali from common salt. And sometime around 1807, Andrew Pears, a farmer's son from Cornwall, manufactured the first transparent soap. In 1885, Pears soap, under the control of Thomas Barrett, Andrew Pears' son-in-law, recruited the actress Lily Langtree to become the advertising poster girl for Pears soap. This is the first time in advertising history that a celebrity was used to endorse a commercial product. The Victorians went to town on the bathroom, but it was only for the upper middle class and the people at the top. And for the working classes, the public bathhouse began to reappear as medical sciences at the time began to link the risk of dirt to disease and infections. The bathhouse would also clean your clothes for you with steam-powered drying rooms to get everything ready for when you'd finished with your ablutions. The modern bathroom, fitted to each house, wouldn't be seen in houses until well into the middle of the 20th century in Britain. In fact, my in-laws separated over the lack of an indoor bathroom, amongst other things, in the 1960s in the northeast of England. Seeing my mother-in-law going back to Germany for three years, as at least it was modernised. It took three years to do enough work to get her to come back to England, a decision she was to regret later in life, as she always believed her life would have been better living in her home city of Lübeck. One item is missing from this build, the toilet. The first flushing toilet, which was invented in Britain by John Harrington in 1596, not Thomas Crapper, as is claimed by some, including Thomas Crapper. But I wonder if the toilet model was in bad taste, so to speak. After all, in the 1930s, Britain was still a very Victorian society, and a toy toilet might not have seemed very correct. And for those of you wanting to know, the Chinese invented toilet paper 2,000 years ago. One last closing point, my last house had a wonderful cast iron bath in it. It was six foot long and took nearly 30 minutes to fill, but it was lovely to lie in and soak in a hot bath. It would retain its temperature for nearly an hour and a half. And a plumber once told me that full, it weighed nearly one ton or 2,000 pounds. Most modern baths come in anywhere from 1,000 to 1,750 pounds when full. So bear that in mind the next time you sink into your bath and enjoy the wonderful history of nearly 5,000 years of engineering, chemistry and geopolitics. <laughs>